Hello, I'm the Angry Spork, taking issue with the Rogue miniseries. Last time, the undefined abilities of one Tanti Matty led our heroine to her not-boyfriend Gambit, who was in the middle of fighting off his wife's top assassins. As Cody's condition gets worse, Rogue takes off without Remy, and no sooner does she touch down in New Orleans is she met by more killers acting on Belladonna's quest for revenge. <laughs> The cover features Belladonna standing menacingly over Rogue, who's apparently traded her bomber jacket for a knife in the shoulder. And some strange coloring choices, I must say. I've heard of pouring salt on a wound, but... chocolate? We pick up where we left off, our heroine surrounded by assassins and narration reminding us of the story so far. She coaxes them to make the first move, knowing they want her to lash out like back in Cody's hospital room. But between what Gambit has told of her of the guild, empowered by Kandra, as well as her danger room training, she's going to play it smart. The killers eventually attack, and she fights them off handily, talking smack to them within her monologue. Are you afraid of hurting their feelings with too much snark? I get wanting to be polite, but they are trying to kill you. She goes on, reminding herself how Wolverine taught her that fighting a group has its advantages, how they tend to get in each other's way and become overconfident by their sheer numbers. They don't act like a team, as the X-Men do. Which gives me pause... at first. Both Assassins and Thieves' guilds have been portrayed as being loyal to their respective groups, not unlike a family. We've seen them work together to fight a common opponent, and yet, you'd think these guys would have learned to be more cohesive in something like this situation. But since they are assassins, involving the quick execution of their targets, teamwork probably wasn't much of a priority in their training. Still, though overwhelming in number, Rogue intends to fight as long as necessary to rescue Cody, and keep Belle from threatening him or Gambit ever again while also hoping the Cajun keeps his word and didn't follow her. That's when we jump to him about 12 miles outside New Orleans on his motorcycle, because, you know, he never actually made that promise to let Rogue go at it solo. He sees someone on the side of the road and accurately assumes it's someone waiting for him. It's his cousin Lepal, warning that entering the city will make him a dead man. Not from the Thieves' Guild, who already consider him such, but the assassins that know he's on the way. Since the two have helped each other out so much as kids, Lapin says that if Remy turns back now, he'll be fine. But with Rogue in the French Quarter on the way to Belle, Gambit motors onward. It doesn't really feel like Lapin really told him anything he doesn't already know. Assassins already tried to punch his ticket at the gas station, and from his own miniseries, he knows going back to his hometown is asking for trouble, even without Rogue's involvement. However, even in comics, action scenes do sometimes need a calm, quiet break, and this serves that purpose very well. And it wouldn't really make much sense if Gambit just popped up in New Orleans too soon without showing his travels just a little bit. And it's his arrival that Belladonna is counting on, hoping the self-professed ladies' man arrives at her mansion before Rogue. Both she and Kandra feel certain the empowered assassins can slow the ladder down long enough for their plans to work out as they want. We want them all here, nice and neat-like. Be having ourselves a regular party soon enough. And once they feel the embarrassment of not having brought a dish, I'll finally have my revenge. Okay, I may not have fully recovered from my coma yet. Rogue is still contending with Donna's minions, who just keep going and going, and she's more anxious to settle things with their boss. She says time's a flying, but it seems like she forgot she can fly too, at any time. Though I don't think she has Belle's address on hand, but her trademark jacket is paying the price! Anyway, Gambit stops in the warehouse district, noticing things are quiet. Too quiet which is actually an appropriate line if the Big Easy is as typically boisterous as pop culture would have me believe. He pulls out a cigarette, thinking he may need to ask around for info on Belle, when Fifolet materializes behind him, 
either to abduct him or let him know this is a non-smoking area. And I guess throwing goons around paid off because now Rogue is at Belle's mansion. However, she figured out where it is. And she also knows that it's quiet. Too quiet. Well, I guess that cinches that she and Gambit are made for each other. Some couples wear matching clothes, others share similar interests. These two use identical cliches. She's still too good for him, though. Grigri emerges from the shadows and gives her Remy's glove and Cody's ID bracelet as signs of the stakes at play. Though that glove exposes the wrong fingers from Gambit's usual pair, so maybe someone just bought some black gloves at a drugstore and they had an intern that never met Gambit cut the fingers off or something. She knocks him into a wall, demanding to know their whereabouts beyond with Belladonna, but gets powder in her face instead. As Fifolet joins in, it turns out that was some kind of fear-inducing drug as Rogue reels back, seeing the features of her foes begin to distort. Well, I know a certain guild whose deep pockets are going to be cleaned out after a lawsuit from one Jonathan Crane. Fifole is unimpressed with the ex-woman, thinking he'll hurt her just like the first encounter in issue one, which is a declaration that snaps Rogue from her fearful fugue and knocks him back, fed up with the assassins getting in her way. Grigory attacks with a stick that looks like it came straight out of the original He-Man cartoon, but, you know, glowing from the power from Kandra. But this doesn't reinstill fear in Rogue, who just throws him out a window. Her eyes are still on fire from the voodoo powder, legally distinct from fear gas, but she still has to find Cody and Remy, the latter of whom, she bemoans, said he wouldn't follow her. Once again, he never made that promise. He actually said he wouldn't be able to keep it because of the circumstances involving Belladonna. She, she, she's so quick to forget their conversation at the bar, she forgets he never officially promised to keep his distance. I know Rogue has problems with her memory around this time, but I didn't think they were this bad. Though it might explain why she'd entertain a romance with LeBeau. As she wanders the mansion, a wild gambit suddenly appears. He uses self-congratulatory boastfulness and flirting. It's... ineffective. I mean, the fact that those are full gloves that don't expose any of his fingers is a dead giveaway. The shapeshifter then tries morphing into Cody, and then Carol Danvers' is Miss Marvel, because they've apparently read up on Rogue's past. Curse you, Marvel Wiki! The Metamorph tries messing with Rogue's head further, attacking in a weird combo of all three previous forms and noting how she hurts those close to her. But the X-Man isn't having it, knocking her enemy out in... <laughs> as her powers deactivate, revealing Questa, whom we briefly have seen at Belladonna's side previously. And... Kandra is standing right there. I guess to remind us, she's the benefactress, and explain she taps into people's mutagenic potential that gives them powers overnight. And for some reason, Questa was supposed to be the best out of the assassin bunch. I mean, yeah, being able to change your physical appearance is a really useful ability, especially for an assassin, but she didn't have, like, enhanced strength. She couldn't mimic powers of people she imitated, and she lost any psychological advantage pretty quickly. Meanwhile, you've got other guild members that are more effective with their powers, shooting lasers and enhancing their weapons and so forth. But no, it's Discount Mystique that was supposed to be the best. Especially when she couldn't even get Gambit's gloves right. Kandra opens a door, and in a scene so shocking, it makes Rogue utter the name of that little monk dude from Shaolin Showdown. Yeah, even he's confused by that reference. She finds Cody, Tanti Matty, and Gambit all locked in elaborate restraining devices. With Belladonna standing in her way, apparently with energy powers of her own, the two women are ready to throw down. Until they're engulfed in pink energy. Kandra, who is telekinetic, I just forgot she used it in the Gambit mini, is sickened by how the women use their powers as a crutch, with the added irritation that it prolongs the game. So she tries the admittedly tricky tactic of nullifying their powers. Wow, a lot of contradiction here. For one thing, Belle hasn't used any superpowers until her hands started glowing. So I don't know how she's been using them as a crutch. Rogue 
the argument just barely applies to her because she can't turn her powers off, and she's also used strategy and straight-up willpower. As far as prolonging the game, why is brevity suddenly so important to Kandra? She's seemingly immortal, or at least very long-lived, and dishes out superpowers willy-nilly, so why is it that she wants this settled so quickly? What were Donna's enhancements that they were supposed to be some kind of match for Rogue's training and strength? The assassin woman is... well, an assassin, so she's confident she can kill just fine without powers. After a little hand-to-hand, -hand, she pulls out a surprise knife and fulfills the cover's prophecy by stabbing Rogue in the shoulder. It is a little awkward that a non-lethal wound was preceded by boasts about how effective a killer Belladonna was, but Rogue's probably in too much pain for the first time in a long time to really consider the irony. We have one more issue to go before this blood feud is settled. How will a depowered Rogue survive against a woman that's rumbled with Hand Ninja? What fate will befall Cody? And will Gambit remotely be found useful in the end? Find out next week. I'm the Angry Spork, and man have I got issues. Mm -hmm.